Well, the US is promising what it's calling a very consequential response to a drone attack that killed three of its troops in Jordan and wounded more than 40 others. US officials say the strike on Sunday hit a military outpost known as Tower 22 near the border with Syria. According to media reports, the enemy drone wasn't shot down because it may have been mistaken for a US drone in the area. US officials blame Iran-backed militants for the attack, though Iran denies being involved. Since the start of the Israel-Hamas war last October, there have been more than 150 attacks on US forces in the Middle East. Missiles fly towards the Red Sea, targeting ships, and from Lebanon into Israel, and from Iraq into Jordan, all fired by groups backed by Iran. Iran backs more than a dozen proxies in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen and Gaza, projecting its influence across the region and aiming to drive out American troops. There are over 30,000 U.S. forces stationed across the Middle East, from several hundred in Syria to more than 10,000 each in Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. Since October 7th, the U.S. also brought warships that have moved closer to Israel and Gaza. So many U.S. soldiers near so many proxy armies and dozens of tit-for-tat attacks and counterattacks, but no direct confrontation with Iran so far. Iran says it doesn't control the groups it's funding. Resistance groups across the region do not take orders from the Islamic Republic of Iran. The Islamic Republic of Iran, while it does not welcome the expansion of conflicts in the region, doesn't interfere in decision-making by resistance groups. But since the Islamic Revolution in 1979, Iran has built up its support for those proxies, sending them hundreds of millions of dollars per year. Its first big success with a proxy force happened in 1983 in Lebanon, when a Hezbollah truck bombing at a U.S. Army barracks killed more than 200 soldiers. The U.S. withdrew its forces from the country. Meanwhile, Hezbollah built a huge arsenal of missiles, since Hamas's terror attack on October 7th, Hezbollah has nearly daily fired rockets into Israel. Iran also arms the Houthi rebels in Yemen. After Israel invaded Gaza, the Houthis attacked ships in the Red Sea. The U.S. has bombed Houthi positions, but the group continues its attacks. Yet another front is in Iraq and Syria, where Iran appears to be encouraging its militias to attack U.S. military bases. Washington has responded with its own strikes. The drone attack on U.S. forces in Jordan was the first since October 7th to kill American soldiers. Three people lost their lives. The attack was claimed by the Islamic resistance in Iraq, a collection of militias backed by Iran. The U.S. says it will mount a consequential response. Until now, the U.S. and Iran have been locked in a war of words, careful not to attack each other's militaries. But the fatal strike on U.S. troops has created pressure from Republicans on President Biden to hit Iran itself, bringing the two countries even closer to direct confrontation. Guido Steinberg is a Middle East expert at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, the SWP, here in Berlin. Guido, welcome back to DW. US officials believe that this drone attack has, quote, the footprints of an Iran-backed Iraqi militia called Qatayib Hezbollah. What do we know about this group? Well, uh, the English uh, translation is uh, the Hezbollah battalions, uh, and it is an organization that is independent. It is distinct from the Lebanese uh, Hezbollah. It has em emerged in the years after the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, and uh, at that time, it was quite successful in fighting American troops in Iraq. Ever since 2014, it has re-emerged on the scene and is probably the strongest uh, Iranian proxy um, in Iraq. It is an organization that is closely linked to the Quds Brigades of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. And of course, um, in, uh, it, is, it is very closely linked to the political leadership in Iran. It is loyal to Iran. It is not loyal to the Iraqi state. Yes, and, and Tehran doesn't deny funding a number of proxy militias in the Middle East, but it says it doesn't control them. Are you convinced by that? 
Well, that is partly true. The, uh, it is uh, quite a diverse network uh, of organizations that we are talking about. And uh, the relationship between Iran and some of these groups is very close. For example, the relationship between Tehran and the Lebanese Hezbollah is extremely close. Um, and in some cases, is, it is not as close. The best example is perhaps the, uh, the Palestinian Hamas. But Qatar uh, Hezbollah is very close to the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. And I believe that it is unthinkable that uh, an Iran loyal organization in Iraq perpetrates an attack on Jordanian territory, an international attack on American troops without uh, the consent of, uh, the, of the Iranian military. Let's dig into that a little bit more. How would escalating military tensions in the Middle East serve the interests of Iran? Well, I Iran follows a dual strategy in the region right now. Uh, first, it does not want a major, a major escalation involving, for example, American or Israeli t uh, attacks on Iranian targets. Part of the reason is that uh, Iran is only a nuclear threshold state, meaning that it doesn't, uh, doesn't have access uh, to nuclear weapons, and therefore it is, it is quite cautious in its responses to what is happening in the region. At the same time, uh, the Iranian leadership wants to push U.S. forces out of the region in order to establish its own hegemony. And the American troops in Syria and in Iraq and connected to this in northern, uh, northeastern uh, Jordan are especially, uh, especially important for the Iranian leadership. So it wants to yeah, it wants to avoid an escalation, but at the same time, it wants to meet its goals concerning the Americans in order to make uh, a future attack against Israel possible. That was Guido Steinberg there, Middle East expert from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Guido, we really appreciate your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, Iran doesn't deny funding its many proxy militias in the Middle East, but says it doesn't control them. I asked Middle East expert Christine Helberg if she's convinced by Tehran's claim. Well, these proxies are strongly allied with and they are supported by Iran, but they do take their own operational decisions. So there is an overall, I would say, strategic coordination between Iran and these militias. It supports Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, the armed groups in Syria and Iraq, but not every attack or assault is ordered in Tehran. So none of these groups obviously would be able to do what they do without the financial and military support that they receive from Iran. And we have to uh, consider that these militias are not only some terrorist groups here and there, but they are political players with considerable influence in the countries that they operate in, for example, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, but also the Iranian-backed militias in Iraq and in Syria. This Islamic resistance in Iraq, the umbrella group that claimed responsibility for the attack on the US outpost, they are uh, pro-Iranian militias and they have a big influence on Iraqi internal policies because the Iraqi government has only limited control over these militias and uh, Prime Minister El Sudani uh, needs them because he created his own governing coalition with the help of these Iranian militias. So they do have a political role, and this is why they can not only be fought with military means. Well, Dr. Merzad Burujerdi is Dean of the College of Arts, Sciences and Education at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. He's also served as President of the International Society for Iranian Studies. Uh, welcome to DW. Uh, so U.S. officials have been quoted as saying that U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria have been attacked around 150 times uh, since October the 7th. Talk us through why this attack is so significant. Yes, I believe, you know, in all the previous attacks, we never experienced uh, the death of U.S. Uh, soldiers, whereas in this case, this has happened. And I think also it's important to keep in mind that we have officially entered the uh, election season in the United States. 
And as we have seen already since these attacks happened, the President Biden is coming under intense criticism uh, from the uh, folks in the in the Republican Party uh, regarding, you know, how he's going to be responding to this thing. As such, I expect that the White House will respond to, to the, this latest attack. The question really is whether it will be carried out in theaters of operation like Syria and um, uh, Iraq rather than Iran itself. Okay. So we have then, um, uh, we have, a, a, the, or the White House has a, has a, a problem, doesn't it? Because the, the calculation is delicate. Um, how to respond in this election year it needs to be strong enough to deter and satisfy President Biden's, uh, Biden's political opponents, but not so powerful as to escalate the current conflict. It's absolutely the case. Look, I think the U.S. administration has made it clear that they do not want the war in Gaza to escalate. And yet, what we are seeing is that U.S. and the British have been forced to fire at Houthi forces in Yemen. United States has had to hit Iraqi forces in Iraq that have been, you know, attacking it, etc. So, and, and yet, at the same time, you know, we are aware of behind-the-scene contact between the Iranians and the Americans, where both sides are insisting that, you know, we are not interested in a wider conflict. And yet, I think what is really worrying a lot of analysts is that, you know, this taking comfort in thinking that the other side... Well, looks like we're suffering some... Technical problems uh, there with that. Oh, are you, you, you're back with us, Doctor. Um, the, we had a, a couple of technical yes. uh, issues uh, there. Um, here's the thing. If, should we take Iran's claim not to want to escalate tensions uh, in the region at face value? Because otherwise, we have to ask, well, why is it backing these proxies who seem to be hell-bent on doing exactly that? Right. No, I don't think we can take Tehran's claim at face value. The fact of the matter is that the Iranians are pushing the envelope through their proxy forces, right? They are, they are trying to send a message that, you know, we are a power to be reckoned with in, in the Middle East and you cannot ignore, you know, our interests, et cetera, et cetera. They have been talking about, you know, having their strategic depth in the region through these, you know, proxy groups, be it Hezbollah, you know, in Lebanon, be it Hamas, in Gaza, or the, you know, um, Hashd al-Shabi forces in Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. So the Iranians are flexing their muscles. They are pushing the envelope, but hoping that, again, due to the uh, complexities of the U.S. Uh, electoral politics, that the Biden administration will not be really uh, engaged in a, any type of attack inside Iran itself. Right. So the... Uh, if I understand your explanation, they do want to escalate tensions there, but they don't want America to attack them at home. That's right. So basically, they are doing these things to get concessions. So, for example, they feel that, you know, since the U.S. is engaging in conversation with the Iraqi government about reducing its military presence in Iraq, that this type of attack can persuade the White House to really pull its forces out or... For example, their other ally, Mr. Assad in Syria, has been consistently objecting to the presence of U.S. forces in Syria, seeing it as a violation of his country's sovereignty. So the Iranians and their proxy groups are hoping that with these set of actions, they can push the U.S. out of the region and therefore, you know, have the upper hand in places like Syria, Iraq, etc. So I think that's part of the, the game plan. The question really is, you know, are they playing with fire, right? Uh, in the in the light of the protests in Iran last year, we know the level of uh, you know, dissent inside the country is very high, and so the the calculation in Tehran should be, you know, if there is a war, would we have popular support or not? And I think at this point, the answer is an absolute no. Okay, so we've concentrated. Uh on the US and Iran, but Tower 22 is in Jordan, near the demilitarized zone uh, between Jordan and Syria. Are we expecting anything, to, are we expecting to hear any response 
militarily from uh, Jordan or Syria, which already have so many problems of their own? You know, I don't believe, you know, Jordan as a fragile state will really get militarily involved. I think, you know, since this was an attack on an American installation, the expectation is that the U.S. will retaliate in kind. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a massive attack on some of these, you know, uh, Iranian-supported forces in Syria as the primary, you know, target here. But yes, the fact that, you know, now the conflict is finding its way to a country like Jordan that was trying its best to sit on the sideline is again, you know, uh, signaling to everyone that the conflict in Gaza is really encompassing the whole region, despite the fact that many of the major players did not want it to be that way. But it seems to be happening. It's becoming a contagious disease in the region. Fascinating analysis, and we thank you for it, uh, Dr. Mehzad Burujerdi from Missouri University of Science and Technology in the U.S. Thank you so much.